with your worksheet. So we'll do this as a group at some point during the presentation as well. Now your phlebotomy, and after Holly's done, we have to finish the phlebotomy. So I'm going to get both the phlebotomy worksheet and the work care worksheet before you leave. Okay. And I'll let Holly kind of her credit and introduction, but she's a wonderful women care nurse. A um, lot of knowledge, very helpful. So all the contact information that she's going to provide, write it down somewhere, keep it somewhere because you're going to need it. Trust me. Um, the quiz is in the book. I think I pretty much give you the answers as we go. Um, should be stuff that we cover. So we'll talk a little bit today about skin assessments, pressure injuries, um, wound care documentation, some of our protocols, and then we'll kind of finish up talking about wound back, negative pressure wound therapy, and some oxygen information. Like she said, I'm Holly. Um, I'm a certified wound oxygen incontinence nurse, um, and now we actually have two more in the department. Sherry and Leslie are working on theirs, and Leslie's finished, Sherry's not quite finished yet. We also have two other full-time nurses, Terry and Lydia, that are here every day of the week. Um, one of them is a certified foot care nurse, Terry is, so hopefully sometime this year we'll start seeing a little more foot care around the hospital, which would be really helpful if we can turn some nails and maybe head off some problems before they end up with amputation. That would be very helpful. We have two PRN nurses, Martha and Almeida, who actually worked with the department a long time ago full-time, retired, and then sort of came back PRN, and they used to work a day or two with us. Our nurse manager is Julie Brandt for extensions 3130. Our office extension is 7032. If you ever needed to talk with us, leave us a message. Always feel free anytime, day or night. Leave us a message. Um, if it's something we need to call you back on, leave us a number to call you back. Or if it's you just want to let us know about a patient, that's fine. Our page is 1205. It's always on if we're here. We are here Monday through Friday, usually eight-ish to four-ish, somewhere in those hours, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little bit later, depending on what we have going on that day. Um, if it's something where you want to speak to us quickly, that's when you can page us. So CMS no longer pays for certain hospital acquired conditions, and pressure injuries are one of these. So these pressure injuries, they affect our HCAP scores. Patients aren't always that happy when they go home with a bed to work, and we call and ask them how their stay was. I've always been thrilled with that. Uh, so they affect those scores. They increase the cost of care that we give to our patients, and this is unreimbursed care for stage three and four pressure injuries, so we don't get any of that money back. Um, the last estimate I read was anywhere from $1,100 to about $70,000 for a hospital-acquired pressure injury, and that could be from something pretty basic that we just maybe add an extra day onto their hospital stay, or just some extra dressings, extra time for wound care to a patient who's here for an extra couple of months, ends up with surgical debridements, a colostomy, a wound back, a specialty bed, just antibiotics if they get an infection or osteomyelitis. <coughs> a lot of extra money spent on care for these patients that's not reimbursed. And then lawsuits and settlements on top of that. There's usually one or two going on at any given time. I think we had a couple emails last week asking us about a few patients that are involved in some lawsuits right now. At one point the hospital attorney she told us they spent around eight hundred thousand over about a five year period just on pressure injury lawsuits. It's a very hot thing right now. You can see it on billboards around right town. Um, and it's not wound care's documentation that they're looking at when they're involved with these lawsuits. It's the bedside staff's documentation. So it's your documentation on turning and repositioning that patient the skin assessments that you do for that patient. If the patient refuses to be turned to a reposition, it's that documentation that they're looking for more than the wound care nurse who's maybe there every three, four, five days to see the patient. And I'm only there for 30, 45 minutes, and I see what I see when I'm there, but I don't see that care that goes on every day, and that's what they're really looking for. And we'll talk a little more about documentation in the next slide or two. The thing we do to get our hospital acquired rate down, which it has come down over the last five years, I think I've been in the department about five years now, um, 
when I first started in the wound care department, our hospital acquired rate was around 16%, which is about four times the national average. The last audit we did, we were just below the national average. We were right around 3%. So we've done a lot better over the last few years, and a lot of it is that staff work. It's not ours. We're out there educating, seeing patients, but it's really what bedside staff does every day. It makes these numbers go down. So things we do to keep an eye on those numbers, help decrease them. We do prevalence audits every quarter. Our next one is the 24th, and some of you may get recruited to help out with that on your unit. Um, we basically do a skin assessment on every patient during the day, check on everybody that's in the hospital, and just this little snapshot of what's going on with our patients. We have a pressure injury prevention bundle for that we rolled out for the ICUs. Beagle management system, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Our department, we do skin checks on patients. If we have time and enough staff, we just kind of go around and check on some of your patients for you or with you who have sort of lower scores or those higher risk numbers. We do root cause analysis rounding. We find anything just to see what education needs or what <coughs> happen. We standardize progress notes and order sheets. And then we do things like this. You may see us at staff meetings. We may just stop you in the hall and talk to you. Um, we do lots of little education when we can. So our standing orders, um, it looks like any other standing order set that you'll see out on the floor. You don't have to have a physician signature to implement it, but they should sign it within 48 hours. Um, we try to mark if there's something that comes from pharmacy on there so you know to make sure it's back to the pharmacy. I think it's good practice to have an extra copy of the orders with you so that they can be in the patient's room or you can pass them along your report. It just makes that report process a lot easier so that dressing change orders don't get lost or lost in translation when you're trying to repeat them back and forth from each other. Call our pages anytime you have questions about wound care orders um, or you think you're running out of a supply that comes from us, anything like that, um, feel free to call our pages so that we can kind of help you out. Or if the physician were to write an order about dressing changes or wound care and you were really unsure what they meant, feel free to call us. So there is some additional information on the internet. Um, patient care library, there's a wound care tab, and there's just tons of little one-page kind of handouts um, that talk about your wound bags, ordering supplies, um, I think there's like what to do if you have a skin tear, there's all sorts of just little tidbits that'll help you out. So this kind of ties into our documentation thing. Um, we should be doing head-to-toe skin assessments on our patients once a shift. This should be part of your shift assessment. Um, should be done every shift <coughs> on admission, whether the patients come from another unit, another facility, straight from home, wherever. If you get a new admission during your shift, they need that good head-to-toe assessment. You should document when you do a dressing change or wound care for your patient. Uh, that's seldom documented. We hardly ever find documentation. But we know it's done because we see the dates and the dressings. When you get a patient back from the OR or a really long procedure, it is a good idea to roll them over, get that extra linen, towels, whatever it is, out from under them, and do a quick skin assessment. Um, we haven't had any in a long time, but at one point we had a couple pressure injuries that we believe started in the OR. And part of what helped us was the, their body site location. And then the, the uh, bedside staff had turned the patient, they had charged an assessment that said the patient had erythema to their scapula. And then we had pressure injury develop, and we knew that that patient had been in surgery and laying flat for so long, and that was where it sort of started. So we got to work with the OR and their positioning and their support services. Prior to discharge, definitely a good idea to have a good scan assessment on your documentation. Um, we've had one or two lawsuits where we kind of argued back and forth with other facilities saying, no, it was, you know, this was not present when they left, or it was present when they got here, and just having that good documentation on admission and on discharge really helps us argue that case so that maybe a family or a patient won't sue us. Or sue somebody else. Which we did have that happen once. Um, it was documentation on admission. We didn't see the patient. The patient came in on a Friday night, so we didn't see the patient until Monday, so several days later. But the admission nurse's documentation was very good. The previous facility was saying, no, 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 they didn't have that when they left here. But we had such good documentation on admission from the bedside nurse that the family decided to sue the other facility and not us because we were able to show that, no, they came here with this pressure injury already here. It looked like this. 
that it was not our fault, it was somebody else's. When doing your assessment, paying attention to bony prominences, the most common places to have a pressure injury are sacrum and heels. Um, any bony prominence, and really anywhere your patient's getting pressure. So even under devices, um, you can get a pressure injury from head hose being too tight, SCDs being too tight, um, masks, splints, anywhere they've got pressure, they can have a pressure injury. When you find something, our preference is that it's described rather than bedside nurses or bedside staff trying to stage pressure injuries. So you want to document body site location. You can give us a relative size. I don't expect you to go find a ruler and measure everything. But the description is really the important part. So we want to know the wound bed color. Is it red? Is it pink, dusky? green, black, yellow, what the drainage looks like, how much there is, what the peri wound skin looks like, because we could see normal skin around a wound, it could be bright red, it could be warm, it could be indurated. We want kind of those descriptive words in there. And unless you're 100% sure and really confident on your pressure injury staging, that description really helps us if we're going back and looking at documentation, because then I can usually take your description and figure out what the state was Especially if I'm called in a week later, the patient's already been here for a while, and I'm trying to figure out if they came in with something or not. If I have a good description on admission, I can usually go ahead and stage it and tell if it was there on admission or not. If you find reddened areas on your patient, we want to know whether or not it blanches. So, <coughs> your theme of the blanches, when you press on it with your finger, it's going to turn white and go back to pink or red or whatever. Um, if it's non-blanchable, if you sit and press on it, it's still going to stay red. Even when you move your finger, it's always going to stay red. So that's non-blanchable erythema. And that's a big difference for us because when we find non-blanchable erythema, that's a stage one pressure injury. And blanchable erythema is not. You have to do a grading scale once a shift. Um, this just helps us determine our patient's pressure injury risk. So the lower their score, the higher their risk for developing a pressure injury. If it's 18 or less, we consider them at risk and they should be on the prevention protocol. Your grade score covers several categories and is assigned to the numerical score for each one. I, this is helpful if your patient's score is a little bit higher, like 17 or 18. They might not need helix boots and a turning wedge, and they may not need the full scope of the protocol. It may be that their problem really is nutrition and maybe it's moisture because they're incontinent all the time. So maybe that's what we need to focus on instead of just turning and offloading them. So use some, you know, you have to use some of your judgment when you do the higher scores of what's most appropriate for your patient. So kind of the basics of our prevention protocol is turning and offloading every two hours, um, heel lift boots, or you can float patients' heels on pillows. Um, I find patients either love the heel lift boots or they absolutely hate them and they won't keep them on. So floating their heels on a pillow is much better than nothing at all. Um, sometimes we don't really find out that they hate the heel lift boots until we put them on and they can come off immediately or start yelling at you today. We want to manage moisture, so keep their skin clean and dry. Um, if they're incontinent, sweating, wound drainage, whatever it is, keep them clean and dry. Not too much linen under your patients. It just makes them warm kind of at the interface of their skin and the mattress. It just traps some of that heat and moisture and can increase their risk for breakdown. We do have barrier cream for incontinent patients. So our barrier cream is meant to go on clear so that you can see the patient's skin under it. Um, we used to have this really thick white pasty stuff that would dry and you couldn't see under it and it was terrible to get off the patient. This is much better to work with but still works. So pretty much less is more with this. Um, you don't need very much and when you put it on your patient you should spread it out until it's nice and clear and shiny. You don't want to just lob it up all over them. It doesn't really do its job and it just makes more of a mess for you to do it. So spread it out so it's nice and clear, shiny. Um, it will take, I'll just let y'all have a look at it. I'm going to pull slide around. It will take me a couple hand washes to get this off so it does stay on pretty well. And my sort of standard, if I have a patient with any kind of incontinence breakdown, it's all right twice a day in PR and soiling. Um, so really just any time you go in there to clean them up should put a little more on them. Please put lotion on your patient's skin when you give them a bath, especially our little elderly patients. 
they get that really dry, fragile skin. It's just more prone to skin tears and other breakdown. We do have a seat cushion that you can order. Um, if your patient's at risk when they're in the bed, then they're at risk when they're in the chair. So a seat cushion should be used. We have Netflix um, sacral dressings. They're not just for ICU patients, really. Um, this is our square size. We have the heart shape that's made for a sacrum. But they're all sort of made the same. These are a polyurethane foam dressing with a silicone adhesive. So they are meant to go on, be very gentle on your patient's skin. Um, they do add a little bit of padding, they'll absorb some wound drainage if we have a wound. But the nice thing about these Methylex dressings is that you can lift them, you can assess under them, and you are able to reapply them. They will re-stick, they're not just a one-time use kind of dressing. We use these for a lot of things, we'll talk about them later. Um, we use them for skin tears, we use them for prevention, we use them for all sorts of stuff. I'll use them as a cover dressing on whatever wound. I already lose that little pecker. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is a really long definition of a pressure injury from the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. Um, I guess the important parts from this is that pressure injuries can present as intact skin or an open ulcer. Because we have deep tissue injuries in stage one pressure injuries that are intact skin, and then our other stages are open. We know it, occur, it occurs as a result of pressure or pressure in combination with shear. And then they kind of added this intense and or prolonged pressure. Um, because this last sentence, our patients have their tissue tolerance is affected by certain things. So the microclimate is where their skin and the linens or sheets think they're under them. That's that microclimate, it's that temperature there. Um, their nutrition status, their perfusion status, comorbidities. Um, if they already have breakdown from incontinence or something else, their soft tissue is already kind of in poor condition, they're much more likely to get a pressure injury faster than somebody who doesn't have those issues. Um, so if your patient's very elderly, very skinny, and nutrition status sucks, they're going to get a pressure injury much faster than you or I would in the same scenario. I'll cover the stages. I promise there's no really awful pictures in here. Try to be very nice. Um, stage one pressure injury, so totally intact skin. There's no open wound there. If I sit and press my finger around, it's all going to stay red. It's not going to turn white and go back. The most important thing I can do for this patient is offload pressure to that area. So I want to make sure that they're turned and they're not let, laying on that same spot for hours and hours. I would put barrier cream um, to protect that skin, especially if they're incontinent. Um, maybe a methyl X dressing, if I could get it to stay on there and it wouldn't get dirty, I would use that to just give them a little extra padding. Stage two is partial thickness tissue loss, so a little bit of the epidermal layer is gone. Still nice and clean and pink, um, very shallow. For this patient, you would either treat them with a methyl X, a hydrocolloid dressing, or again, if that patient were very incontinent in my dressings, getting dirty all the time, I would just do barrier cream. Um, this is a hydrocolloid dressing. It is meant to go on your patient and stay on for three to five days. And once it's on, it's on. It's not one of those you can get to look under and put it back on. The same thing with the methyl X dressing. They're meant, hydrocolloid and methyl X dressings are meant to stay on for several days. And if they're not, if you're having to change the single shift for a couple times a shift, then it's really not getting to do its job. So we need to do something else or use barrier cream if, if that patient's incontinent. But we still want to protect the skin, and we're not really doing it if we're getting stool or urine under that dressing all day long. And still we want to offload pressure. Offload pressure to that area. It really doesn't matter what dressing I use. If I don't keep pressure off that area, it's not going to heal. So stage three pressure injuries, full thickness tissue loss. So we're down into sub-Q tissue, and this picture is a heel, so it's not very deep. 
But you can have a stage three on like a bug that's very, very deep because you have a lot of stuff to issue there. So these can kind of be very in depth. The depth doesn't necessarily reflect the stage of it. So no bone, tendon, or muscle visible, just so acute tissue. But at this point, we do start seeing some of that necrotic tissue or tunneling or undermining. If this patient came in when wound care is not here, you want to make sure wound care is consulted. But to manage that patient until they're seen by wound care, we want a damp saline dressing to that wound. So I'll get some 4x4 gauze, dampen it with saline, lightly pack it into the wound bed, DVD pad, curl it, tape, change that once a shift to wound care sees that patient. Stage four, anytime we see bone, tendon, or muscle, we have a stage four pressure injury. Doesn't really matter how deep it is, that's a really shallow one just put all like truth nice and clear that we're seeing bone and tendon. Um, where's that at? Uh, so what's my second? Where's okay. Where is it? He said heel. I couldn't tell where it was at. I think it's either heel or an ankle. It looks like um, an ankle. I think it's an ankle. Like like you find pictures on Google and it doesn't really tell you yeah. Yeah. what's going yeah. on. There's a picture. I'll go, I'll go back. So I would do the same thing with this patient. Consult wound care and a damp saline dressing. Um, when we talk about undermining, that's undermining is where there's kind of a lift edge on the wound and the tunneling would be a deep tunnel sort of down into the wound. And you know, I say put dressings on until wound care comes to see them. That also implies that when this patient hits the door, that their old dressings are taken off. Because um, we can't really do an accurate assessment if we don't take old dressings off. They don't need to be left on for three days until wound care comes to see the patient or whoever comes to see the patient. They need to be taken off and the wound will look at. Um, we have a few facilities we'll send patients in with like prophylactic dressings on. So we'll get consulted, go see them. Nobody's ever taken the dressings off and there's no wounds there. It's just they've done their own version of Mepilex or whatever for their heels or, or whatever it is. So we want to look under dressings and see what's going on. So an unstable pressure injury, and I picked a very nice picture. There are some very not, not nice ones um, if you do a Google image search for either stage four or unstable. Um, this is an angle as well. So when it's unstable, all it means is there's too much necrotic tissue for me to really assess the full depth and stage of that wound. So I can't tell if there's bone, tendon, or muscle visible or not because there's just too much necrotic tissue in the way. I would still do the same thing, um, a damp saline dressing, make sure wound care is consulted, um, and offload pressure to that area. Don't leave that patient leaving on, leaning, leaning on that side or laying on that side or maybe a boom or whatever it is that's caused that injury. We don't want that in the way. So deep tissue injuries. Um, this is what we see the most of for hospital acquired pressure injuries. I actually just typed up our list for April and probably 80% of them were deep tissue injuries. So deep tissue injuries present as this maroon purple discolored area with erythema around it. And all it's telling us is there's some kind of deeper tissue damage going on and we don't really know the full extent of it yet. We just know there's something going on over there. Generally, they present as this. As they start to evolve, this usually happens. Um, this little top layer of skin will start blistering and peeling. It will come off. And then we'll have the bottom picture there. And then most of the time, that starts turning into edge part, that black leathery um, dead tissue. But not always. The other thing about deep tissue injuries is I couldn't look at this and tell you exactly how that's going to progress and end up. Um, a lot of it depends on the patient and kind of the damage that happened prior to. But they always start out kind of looking like this. They start to evolve and then we kind of treat them based on how they evolve. If your patient comes in with anything like this, it needs to be documented very completely. Um, your patients that are more likely to come in with something like this are those that are found down at home and been down for 24 hours or more, this is usually what they're going to come in with. Um, and you can usually kind of paint a picture of how they were down based on where those marks are. Our sort of standard treatment for these are Methylex. If we're able to keep it on, if a patient's really incontinent, we would do barrier cream. But we do Methylex in the area and pretty aggressive offloading. Um, there's 
a little bit of research telling us that a foam dressing and very, very aggressive offloading helps these to resolve a little better with minimal damage. Um, I've seen patients with deep tissue injuries either here or the last hospital card one we had that went really bad. It was actually up through the sacral cleft and up into their lower back a little bit. And that patient ended up with stage four pressure injury, osteomyelitis, um, like we pulled out a piece of bone doing a wound back change that was infected and soft and flaking off. Um, an ostomy, a specialty bed. He ended up with a lot of very extensive, very, very extensive wound based on what his original deep tissue injury looked like. Um, it was pretty bad and it was all required. And this happens when your patient's left leg in one position for too long. So medical device related pressure injuries, we do see a few of these, not, not a ton. Um, we have recently had a couple from CPAP mask get a little too tight across the bridge of the nose. We worked with respiratory on that. Um, if you have an elderly patient that has oxygen tubing, ask your respiratory therapist for some little foam protectors for their oxygen tubing. They're like 15 cents each, and they go a long way in preventing those little pressure injuries that elderly patients are very prone to get on the tops of their ears from that tubing. Um, any kind of splint or device that your patient has on can cause a pressure. So just be mindful of that, you know, don't leave an O2 sac probe on their ear and leave them laying on that side for, you know, two, three, four hours. Move it to the other side. Um, make sure your NG suits aren't too tight. Just things like that to be mindful of with your patients. So not all wounds are pressure injuries. The only thing that we stayed with a one, two, three, or four is pressure injury. Anything else, any skin tears, lacerations, abrasions, incisions, things like that that your patient has, we just say that those are partial fitness or full fitness. We don't use numerical staging um, criteria for those. And if you're ever unsure if something is a pressure injury or is not, that's when you want to give us a call and make sure that we see that patient. Um, or stop us in the hallway. You know, if you see us up in the hallway and you just assessed your patient and were unsure about what you saw, just stop us and say, hey, can you come in here and take a look at this real quick? Our department helped out with specialty beds a little bit. Um, when the hospital switched to Hillrom beds, they purchased some wound care and bariatric beds, but they don't necessarily go through us anymore. Used to, we rented all of our specialty beds, so I had to go through our department. But now these are actually in the hospital and you can get a hold of them and get a um, So I would ask either your charge nurse or your clerk to help you out with that. Is your wound care bed the plan? It is not, but we can rent those if we need them. We don't rent very many just because they're big and expensive and they weigh about 9,000 pounds. And so we, we don't rent them unless we really, really need them. But we can use them. I don't think we have any in the hospital right now. Oh, not for my reason. They're, I hate, they need a professional notice. They're really, yeah, they're really kind of a pain to use. Um, I took the slide out, I did have a slide about them. They do have like a little transfer button on them and you can turn the fluidization on. Like kind of walk through the wet concrete. Yeah. I do wound care, like I would get the patient turned and I would hold my hand down and hold the bed down and then have whoever turn the bed off so that it create this nice little crater for me and then I could work. Um, but they are just kind of cumbersome to deal with. But they're great beds, so just only for the right kind of patient. But if you need like a wound care or bariatric bed, um, your unit clerk, charge nurse, whoever's orienting you can help you with getting them through teletracking. And these are the two that you have available to you that are in in-house. So a very active bed is pretty easy to spot. Um, things I'll say about it is you want to make sure that the bed is fully expanded before you put your patient in it. Because they collapse it to get it in and out of the doors. So you want to make sure that it's, the frame's all the way expanded before you set the patient down. So that way the mattress isn't hanging off the side and the patient slides off the side of the bed. Transport has been really good about making sure that's done before they leave it. Um, I was watching them set it up in a patient's room the other day and they were really good to make sure everything was set up before they left. These beds are, the bariatric beds are made of little horizontal air bladders um, that run up the mattress and they're all connected to like a central hose, which is these tiny little hoses that click together. 
So if you ever turn one on and you notice part of it isn't inflating, you can unzip the cover and you can see where the hoses connect and you can very easily see if any of them become disconnected and they just snap back in. Um, what happens sometimes is if it's not deflated all the way before it's collapsed, the little hoses will snap. Um, so that's just something to kind of remember if you ever notice it's not inflating, but you can call us too if you ever notice that. Um, the wound care bed, looks just like your med surge bed, it's on the same frame. It does say wound care on the side rails and the footboard. And then the mattress is bright royal blue. Um, the standard med surge mattress is navy blue. So skincare products are passed around the barrier cream. Um, we have lotion, don't use a ton of baby powder. I don't like baby powder, my own personal crusade against it, I think. Um, if your patient has skin <coughs> right now and they have a rash, we can get antifungal body powder that's a little more useful than just using baby powder on them. Um, and I don't like rolling a patient over to do wound care in their sacral area and getting a big pop of baby powder in my face. It's not very fun. Um, we have two kinds of body wash there, the same thing. One is in a spray bottle and one is kind of in a gel form. The spray bottle is great. If you have a patient with incontinent episodes, you can spritz them, wipe with a washcloth, and you're done. You don't have to do the whole, get the washcloth wet, get the gel cleanser on it. They're, they're very easy for those little spot cleans. <coughs> Baby wipes are available if you need them. Um, they're a much gentler way to clean up your patient than our washcloths are. If you have a patient with any kind of breakdown that's very sensitive, you can use the baby wipes. You can order a seat cushion, turning wedge, and heel lift boots from materials. Um, in your unit clerk can help you with this until you kind of memorize these things. Um, our heel lift boots look like this. They are just bright, bright purple now. Um, speaking of the heel lift boots, there is a correct way to put them on. They have a little tag at the bottom that says toes so that you know you're putting them on the patient the correct way. I find them on upside down all the time. Um, I mean, I think they still kind of work, they're just not as comfortable. And then there is a little tag on them that says, please do not walk in these, so make sure your patients are not trying to walk in their heel lift boots. We have had patients try to do that before. Um, you know, if they tell you they're not comfortable walking, just remind them, please don't walk in. So your turning wedge, when you turn a patient, this turning wedge should be from their hips to their shoulders. We don't want it halfway up their back where their hips are hanging backwards off of it or on the bed, and we don't want it so far down that their shoulders are doing the same thing. We want it under hips and shoulders so that their body is turned. If your patient won't tolerate the wedge, they keep wiggling off of it, tell you they don't like it, you can try a pillow to turn your patient. Um, a pillow is not the ideal turn because it doesn't give them that full turn, but it's better than nothing. So I will use a pillow if the patient hates the wedge off of it, I'll try to fill up. So your skin and wound care protocol, this should be placed on a patient's chart when their grading score is 18 or less, this should be on their chart. The first page walks through your prevention protocol measures, just kind of the, the standards that we talked about. Second place, or second place, whew, second page covers um, newer existing wounds, when the consult does, um, any time you find a stage three, four, full thickness, deep tissue injury, make sure that you consult us so that we know about that patient. Um, things that can be managed by the nurse. Um, skin tears or really superficial abrasions can be managed by the nurse without consulting wound care. Um, little dry scabbed areas. If you, if you notice your patient has a yeast rash, you don't have to consult wound care. You can just tell the doctor, hey, this patient has yeast rash going on. Um, can I get some antifungal cream or antifungal powder and get it ordered that way. Same thing with skin folds. Um, it's getting warmer. We're going to start getting a lot more patients with breakdown in their skin folds. Um, so we don't have to come see every one of them. I think we can probably all figure out pretty quickly what it looks and smells like on our patients. Um, I almost like by default, if I go see a diabetic patient that's overweight, I just expect them to have some kind of just like the first question out of my mouth is, are you itching anywhere? Um, so just keep that in mind, especially if it's getting warmer, is that we're more likely to see that. 
And soap and water goes a long way with a lot of these issues, especially these skin fold issues. Um, washing that patient twice a day with soap and water, applying your antifungal products. You can put a pillowcase, a clean dry pillowcase in the skin folds to help with moisture. That all goes a long way with those patients. Anytime you find a wound on a heel, um, make sure to wear consult so that we can kind of see what's going on with that patient. I wish we did. We tried it once. We tried a trial. I left signs in the room. I wrote on it, don't throw it away. So I'm like, there's no way they're going to let us spend that kind of money on something that's going to get thrown away. But I tell patients about it, and they can buy it on Amazon. It's what fantastic the, stuff. What was the question? It's inner dry. It's like under armor, basically, with silver woven into it. So it's great for skin fold issues. Um, it can be reused up to, I think it's a week, but it just didn't work that well in patient because it got tossed a bunch and, and it wicks fluid away from it. Wicks, yeah, wicks, wicks that away. moisture away. The silver that's woven into it will kill that yeast or any bacteria that they have in the skin folds. It's fantastic stuff, but it's expensive and but it can't be gotten. It can't be purchased over the counter. Yeah. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it straight from Cold Class. You can buy pretty much anything with here on Amazon. I probably yeah. sell all the time. I'll give them packages from stuff. Amazon has everything. So skin folds, these are all good examples of a yeast rash on your patient. Um, my own personal preference, if I'm dealing with like an underarm or buttocks, um, I will usually order antifungal cream so that I know it gets good contact with the whole rash. Sometimes it's hard to get powder to stay under arms or on somebody's buttocks. So I'll usually do cream for that. Now, usually like pants fold and groin, I'll usually do powder because it's usually already kind of a moist area anyway. I'll usually do some powder there. And then usually a dry pillowcase just to help wick that moisture away. So skin tears, that's another thing you don't have to consult us for unless, you know, if it's a massive, massive skin tear, certainly by all means consult us or if you just have questions on what to do, give us a call. If you can, it helps your patients heal a little better. If you can roll that skin flap back into place and secure it with steri strips, your patients heal a lot faster and they heal better. If you can't, that's okay. Um, the Methylex border dressings are our standard for skin tears. So I passed around the six by six. You can also order a four by four and a three by three Methylex um, under materials management. So they'll send it from the basin to your floor. And you can put that on your patient, and they can actually stay on for up to a week. And just you can assess under them and place them back down, um, as long as they're not fully saturated with drainage. If your patient is, say, they're very edematous and that skin care is just draining a ton, and you're soaking the Mepilex, the next thing I would do is not use the Mepilex, and I would do zero form, um, zero form gauze and ADD pad and Curlex on that patient, just so that I'm not wasting those Mepilex dressings. Your form and curl is a lot more cost effective to use. No tape or tegaderm over their skin tears. Um, we're likely to give them another skin tear when we go to remove that or deal with that. If you if somebody comes in, I find patients that come in from home with skin tears and their family will put band aids all over them because they don't really know what else to do. Um, you try to get a hold of an adhesive remover, try to get those off your patients very gently. You save yourself a lot of trouble. So we've got kind of three different types of heel wounds going on. Um, you want to make sure you consult us if you come across any of these. So a blood filled blister like this, that's a deep tissue injury. <coughs> Some kind of deroof blister, a bunch of dead skin, you don't have to peel that off. Um, this we see a lot on diabetic patients. So that's dry, stable edge car, so that's that black, hard, leathery stuff. And this kind of acts as the patient's own band-aid. It protects the wound, it allows it to heal from the inside out, keeps out germs. So we try to leave that alone. Um, our default, especially with diabetic patients, is we want to keep their feet clean and dry. So we will usually paint stuff like that with Betadine just to keep it clean and dry. We try not to put a wet dressing on that and start softening it up. Holly, do y'all ever get called to help out with fracture blisters? Because I know sometimes they can stab and always know what to do with those. We don't really. 
I don't know if I don't know if like orthotrauma can handle it on their own. We don't always call them or stuff like that. And you guys, uh, if this is a level of trauma center, and just because you may not be going to an orthopedic or trauma area, you may end up with one of those patients. And sometimes when the, the, the shearing between the skin layers and the muscle layers and the bone, people with bad fractures will end up with huge blisters. Sometimes they're clear and sometimes they look like the one on the top where they're actually the lower layers of the dermis and stuff were, in, were uh, dis, distressed. And so they'll fill with blood. So you'll notice the orthopedic guys they like to leave them intact, I yeah. think, but when you, after you've had your patient in the unit for a while, you roll them and stuff, and sometimes they do pop. Yeah. Uh, but they won't drill through them, they won't operate through them, they'll wait for that skin to heal up before they'll even do an egg six and stuff like that. So it's a different, it's not necessarily a pressure ulcer, but if it's bad enough, Holly and them can help you with that as well. Yeah, and we generally don't um, pop blisters. Um, if they pop on their own, it's fine, that's one thing, we generally don't drain them. Um, Try not to create an opening for infection if you don't If a doctor wants to drain it, that's totally fine. But I'll use it long enough, we don't do that. Um, so negative pressure wound therapy, so this would be your wound backs. Um, we only are supposed to say it's a wound back if we're referring to a KCI, they own that term. Um, this is the hospital wound back, it's a KCI back Ulta. We've had these for maybe six months now. I don't know, we've had them for a little while now. They're much better than the old backs that we used to have. Um, they're very straightforward to use. You have a power button on the front. You have an eject button for your canister that makes it pretty easy to change the canister in and out. Um, the screen is all touch screen. There is literally a play and a stop button for your therapy to turn it on and off. Or start it and stop it if you had to unload your patient. And then there's a question mark at the bottom of each screen. If you click that question mark, it'll tell you what the different functions are on that particular screen that you're on. It'll tell you what they do. Hopefully you won't have to do much with these if you have a patient who'll move back um, other than document that it's there. So we usually change the dressings two to three times a week. Um, we can set our suction for intermittent or continuous, but it's almost always continuous. If you have a patient with any kind of wound back or negative pressure, you want to document that in your nursing assessment. So you want to document where is that on their body? Look at the front of your machine and see what the suction level is set at. Take a look at their dressing. You need to see that it's intact and the sponge is compressed so it looks like all the air has been sucked out of it. Um, your machine will tell you if there's any air leaks. And assess the drainage that's in the canister. So the canisters are clear. They're marked so that you can keep up with the output throughout your shift. And you want to document those kind of things. If your pump starts beeping for whatever reason, try to patch the dressing if you can. Um, Usually, if you maybe you skewed at your patient or something like that, part of the dressing <coughs> off, you can just put either Tegaderm or the back drape over it. We're just trying to maintain that airtight seal. Um, you want to give the managing service a call if you keep having a problem with your wound back. Call us or call whatever service is managing it. So if it's vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, whichever whichever team is doing the back dressings give them a call. If you call us and we have not seen the patient and we're not familiar with them, that's usually the first thing we're going to ask you is if you call the managing service. Um, there's a few of them that don't mind us coming to help or fix their dressings, and then there's a few of them that don't want us to and they want to come do it themselves. Um, and that's totally fine. Sometimes resetting the pump, like turning it off and back on kind of, kind of helps or changing out the canister. There is like a little filter at the top of the canister and if you get it wet it thinks that it's full and it'll start beeping at you. So sometimes just changing out those things and turning that pump off and back on will help. And then check your tubing. Maybe your patient's rolled their bedside tray over it or something like that. You can check on that. I've stepped on them and set the alarm off and took a minute to figure it out. So this is super, super important and it gets its own slide. Your patient should not be disconnected from their back suction for more than two hours. If their back dressing fails, if it comes off, if you can't get it patched and no one's here to help you, if they have a bowel movement and just soil the thing up, take it off, clean your wound, and do a damp saline dressing to the wound until somebody can come fix that back. Um, what we don't want to have happen is that a 
back sponge and dressing just sits on the patient for hours and hours and hours with no suction. That creates a greenhouse effect, drainage pools in the wound, bacteria, everything's trapped in that kind of warm, moist environment, and it's disgusting when you go to take it off. Uh, I found a back once that had been on 48 hours with no pump, no canister, no nothing. The patient came from Siskin, went through our ER, was seen by orthopedic surgery multiple times for a wound that was literally right next to their back dressing, went to the floor, no one addressed it. They never consulted us. We actually found the patient on just a random skin check because the bedside nurse documented there was a wound present on admission, so we came to just check on the patient. That was the most disgusting thing when I took that off. And that probably set the patient back a little while in their wound healing. So we gave that patient a little back vacation, got to give them a few days off their back before we put anything back on them. Um, so if you see a patient that comes to your floor, maybe they've been in the ED, <coughs> ED didn't get to come up to a pump, or they came in with something that didn't match ours, it wasn't the same brand, just take it off, do a damp saline dressing, and consult with care. Don't just let the patient sit with that. Um, sometimes the ED gets overwhelmed, they forget about ordering a back pump, or patients come in, don't tell them that they have a back, um, or their machine dies, if they bring their home machine, whatever crazy stuff happens. So if you're the one that finds it, take it off, do that damp saline dressing and consult us so that we can come figure out what's going on and fix that patient up. KCI has 24 hour troubleshooting. If you ever have trouble with your pumps, you can call them 24 hours a day and they will help you. Um, this used to be more relevant with our old pumps because we had one that would slip into like Dutch or some other language <laughs> randomly <laughs> and we couldn't figure out how to Take it back. I had, to, I had to call them one day because I could figure out what to do with it. Um, but we don't have that problem. So some other negative pressure that you might find, um, these are all disposable systems. So these little machines only last for about seven to ten days and the normal machines just die they have a chip in them and they stop working and can't turn them back on. Um, this one's made by Smith and Nephew. It's meant for low draining wounds. It's generally used on intact incisions. Ortho uses it sometimes. You might find it on a high-risk C-section. Um, they can be applied by the nurse. They're very easy to apply. They um, come in different sizes, and they'll peel and stick like the Mepilex. They're really easy to stick on. Cardiothoracic and spine surgery, we use this purple one a lot, and it actually has an adapter where they can connect it to the big pump. Um, but it's the little pump that comes with it is what's meant to go home with the patient. Same thing, it's gonna work for seven to 10 days and then it's gonna shut off. And when they shut off, we take the dressing off, the whole thing off, throw it away, and put some of the kind of dressing on. These are all intended for patients to go home with. So it'd be like an outpatient surgery or something like that, but we still find them on our inpatients sometimes. Um, this one's similar to our regular hospital vac. It's just a disposable one that's made by Cardinal, but it's got a, comes with two 250 ml canisters but it's a similar dressing setup. This would be applied by either us or actually the cast person from the ortho office. We'll put these on before he was a cast sometimes. So, this is everybody's favorite part, the fecal management system. Um, anybody ICU? Okay. Yay. Yeah, well, actually be your best friend even though you think it sounds gross. I know, it really does sound gross, but these can really save you a lot of time and So, several years ago, the hospital purchased a fecal management system from Bard called the Digna Shield. If you can put a Foley catheter in, you can put one of these in. It's much easier to find where it's supposed to go. Um, <laughs> Anybody can do it. Um, if you ever had to put one of these in, or if you think your patient needs it, we need a physician order for it. It's really meant for our patients who are having three to six loose stools in 24 hours. That's kind of our standard criteria. It's great for patients with C. diff, although they don't have to be C. diff positive to have this. These work better for your patients who are non-ambulatory and usually not very with it. If your patient's alert and oriented, they're generally not going to tolerate this for very long. Um, and if they're ambulatory, they need to be getting up and going to the bathroom. So, if your patient's going all day, change their um, bed five times the shift, then start thinking about one of these. Ask your physician if it's appropriate. So this little device goes in the rectum, 
it will be seated at the bottom of the rectal vault and all the stool is going to drain down this tube and into this lovely bag. These bags like snap and lock on. Once these fill up, we just take them off and we throw it away. And then we put a clean one on. We do not empty the stool out of this bag. So what this device is supposed to do is to sort of create a containment system for that liquid stool so that you're not cleaning up stool from the patient's shoulders to their feet and changing a bed two, three times a shift. Keeps everything nice and contained for you. Is that um, one size fits all? Do what? <laughs> yes. Sort of. That's okay. It only comes one size, but your patient has to have enough like rectal tone to hold it in. Or keep it in. So. Sometimes that, that is an issue in itself. Um, but we try our best to sort of keep them in place. And I will, that kind of leads me to the next the next portion of, of my discussion with these. So please remember these are disposable. Put a new one on, don't try to empty them. I found a nurse trying to empty one of these one day and it was horrible, <laughs> horrible. I had like one of those panic move, like little moments where I stopped doing what I was doing and yelled and told her to stop doing that. It was, it was a big mess. Once, once you run out of, out of the bags the system, where do you get? We actually, they have just the bags themselves in um, materials. So, like a Foley catheter, this is held in place by a balloon. What is nice about this system is it is designed for this kind of insertion. This balloon does not press against the rectal mucosa like a red rubber catheter balloon or something will. It's much gentler. Your syringe comes marked with 45 ml, so the balloon is meant to hold 45 ml of water, no more, no less, really. Um, so I'll show you what 45 ml looks like. So that's 45 ml in that balloon. Still has enough give in it, easy in your patient. There's still enough room for stool to drain through the device. What will happen a lot of times, this is leaking around it. Um, nurses will want to add more to the balloon, thinking if I fill up the balloon more, it's going to stop the leak. Um, what they made this device do, which was pretty clever on their part, is when you overfill the balloon, the device collapses inward on itself rather than expanding outward and pressing on the patient's rectum mucosa. It's going to make your leak worse if you try to overfill the balloon. So we want that 45 ml. If my patient were leaking, um, I would pull everything out of the balloon, make sure it had 45 ml in it, start from scratch with that and then you want to kind of tug it and make sure it's seated at the bottom of the rectum. So you're going to be able to see this little black line that's why it's there so kind of help you figure out if it's in the right position and have it migrated upward. So green port balloon, they color coded everything. This purple port actually flushes out the tubing itself and you can flush it once or twice a shift with just some tap water just to clean out the tubing. And there is a specimen port at the bottom of it if you needed a specimen for your patient. The kits come with directions. They come with one of these nice little stickers for your patient's chart um, that kind of lists why you're doing it and then any contraindications. Um, comes with lube, comes with air freshener. It is a self-contained, ready-to-go kit. I probably have not helped anybody insert one of these in like a year. Um, when we first rolled out with them, we helped a lot and now we really don't get called to help with these very much because the nursing staff is pretty comfortable with using them. Um, just make sure you get a physician order. You know, if this were my first time using one of these things, I would get my charge nurse or somebody else on my unit that knew how to use it to just kind of help me out, make sure I did the right steps. Um, it is not sterile, so if for some reason it came out of your patient and say landed on the bed, you can rinse it off, put it back in. If it came out and landed on the floor and everybody stepped all over it, I'd probably get a new one. Um, that has happened before too. But they are very useful um, for the right patients. They are useful and will save you a lot of trouble. I worked at a facility where we had a flush on a few shifts with at least 60 ml of water like up through the clear port. We don't actually flush up through that port. The only time I have ever seen them use that is I got a call once about 
they were instilling something. They needed to give the patient some kind of MRI. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of what that port is designed for. We really only say to flush out the actual tubing for that purple port. Yes? If you're doing it in the flush port, is there a way to shut it off so that things are going to just drain back into the bed? You could actually kind of crimp the tubing off. Um, and that's, that is another thing I'll say. The tubing is meant to go straight between their legs at the end of the bed. A lot of times if you have it going under their leg or over their leg, it is going to sort of cut itself off. Um, it's just working by gravity. Um, and we also need their stool to be thin enough to go through it so the pain starts getting too thick, it's not going to work. We have used these um, on a wound patient that was not appropriate for colostomy. We actually used one of these and had the physician put on kind of a bowel program to keep their stool thin so that it would work and keep the stool off their wound. And it did actually we were actually pretty successful doing that. So I already mentioned appropriate rectal tone, uh, three to six loose stools, 24 hours, need to be semi-liquid liver consistency. You don't have to have CDS, but if your patient is positive for CDS, that is something to think about. You can use these on the floor. They are not just for ICU patients, but like I said, it's generally those patients who are kind of non-ambulatory and not all that good that, that are sort of best suited for this. We don't use them on these patients. Um, they've had lower large bowel rectal surgery last year, any kind of injury, stricture stenosis, um, fecal impaction. If they have any other indwelling rectal or anal device, we don't use it in rectal bleeding precautions. We do not use these. Um, and that goes back to getting a physician order for it so we make sure that the patient is the appropriate patient for it. If you have, if your patient has one, um, you want to assess that cuff placement, you'll see that black line. Um, check the, the balloon volume. Use that um, purple port irrigated regularly. Just helps keep that tubing clear. Um, and then you want to assess any leakage. Um, you know, it's good care if you're going to turn that patient anyway to look at their skin. So wipe them off, clean them. If they do have any leaks, the barrier cream protect us. Um, even with a little leakage, I think a little leakage with one of these is better than a bed full of Continuing in our discussion of bowels, we will talk about ostomies next. So we have three different types of um, ostomies that we see primarily here at Erlanger. Um, we have ileostomies that use a small bowel, colostomies where they use a large bowel, and a urostomy um, uses a little portion of the small bowel to drain urine. So ileostomy patients, most often it's the terminal ileum, but it can be really anywhere in their small bowel. The important things as a bedside nurse for one of these or tech is we expect this output to be mushy and liquid and unpredictable. Small bowels always, always moving. Um, generally, this is very high volume output on a new one, a new ileostomy. They'll often have like fill up a pouch within 15 minutes kind of volume. Um, and then gastric enzymes. Um, the output for an ileostomy still has gastric enzymes in it. So we want to make sure that our pouch fits appropriately and doesn't have too much skin show. Um, if we have too much skin showing or a leak, these patients will get skin breakdown very, very quickly. Um, you know, within 30 minutes, they might tell you their skin's burning because those gastric enzymes are already starting to eat away their skin. So skin care is important, the pouch fitting appropriately. Changing it as soon as it leaks is, is very, very important. We don't want to leave a patient with a leaking ostomy appliance. Um, once we start having skin breakdown, it makes it that much harder to get a pouch to stay on them the next time. So we want to try to prevent that. And then fluid electrolyte balance is really important with these patients. They are losing a lot of excess fluid um, and electrolytes through that ostomy output more than they would be normally. So we just want to pay attention to that. And especially, that's really important for us when we send our patients home, is they need to stay hydrated. Um, I generally teach patients, you know, you need to drink your eight glasses a day, but when you have an ileostomy, you still need to drink those eight glasses, but then they need to drink an extra glass of something where they can take out, just to help make up for that loss. Any kind of liquid counts other than alcohol. Um, patients can still have a drink. It just doesn't count as their fluid intake for the day. If you're on the floor and you have a patient that has a new ileostomy and they're letting them have a diet, um, 
we want to make sure that they're not progressed to a regular diet too quickly. A low residue diet is more appropriate. Um, ileostomy patients, if they eat too much insoluble fiber in one sitting, especially with a new ileostomy, they can get a blockage because they already have some swelling and it's a smaller opening that the stool's traveling through. We have too much of that insoluble fiber getting in the way and the blockage. Um, if you have a patient with a new ileostomy and they are putting out copious amounts of liquid stool and you cannot keep it empty, you can get a high output pouch from us. So this pouch has a much bigger spout on the bottom and you can connect it straight to a Foley bag. And that will save you a lot of effort in emptying that pouch every 30 minutes. And make it probably easier to keep up your output. <clears throat> right now those are only available through us. So if you think you need one, give us a call. Most of the surgeons know that we have those. So they might ask you for it as well. That works better than a urine pouch. Um, I see people use urine pouches a lot, and that'll usually work for a little while, but if the patient has any kind of thickened output, that urostomy pouch is not going to work. So colostomy uses the large bowel. It can be the ascending, transverse, or descending colon. The closer the patient's stoma is to their rectum, the more normal and predictable that output's going to be. The further away it is, the more it's going to start to resemble an ileostomy and be softer, looser, and less predictable. The important thing for these patients is gas and odor. Um, colostomies obviously have much more odor <coughs> than ileostomy because you still have that gut bacteria that causes the odor. Um, so it's important for these patients to be very, say like this nonchalant, very accepting of what's going on in the room. Don't walk in the room and say, oh, it's so gross, it smells disgusting. Start spraying air freshener. Um, we don't want to act like this is a big deal. Um, patients are extremely self-conscious about this. Um, any kind of ostomy, really, they're very self-conscious about it. It's usually my colostomy patients that are a lot more self-conscious about it. Um, it only takes a few bad experiences. Your patients don't want to go anywhere anymore. They don't want to live their life the way they used to live it. They're embarrassed. They think everybody can tell they have a big bag of poop on their stomach and can smell it and see it. Um, so we want to be very accepting of these patients and very careful in how we interact with them. And, you know, make it seem like it's no big deal. Because it's not. It's just going to the bathroom. It's just coming out somewhere different. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about emptying a pouch in a little bit. And this is, especially with colostomy, we want to be careful in how we empty our pouch and keeping everything clean so we don't have those odor issues. The urostomy. You may see it called an ileal conduit um, or an ileal loop urinary diversion. Basically, they take a little segment of the ileum. One end of it has the urine connected to it, and the other end is brought up as a stoma on the abdomen. And we pouch that like we would a colostomy or an ileostomy. Urine flow is always constant. This isn't a continent diversion. Um, that makes it, I think, these are probably the ones the biggest pain to change when the patient's in the hospital because we're always dumping them full of IV fluids so there's always urine dripping and it makes it hard to keep their skin clean and dry while you're trying to do the pouch at the same time. Um, fluid electrolyte mouth is still important for these patients at home. They'll think they're going to be super smart and not drink anything because they don't want to get their pouch wherever it is they're going for the day and then they will end up dehydrated and with a UTI. So we have to remind them you still do that. You can, our urine pouches, you can hook up to a Foley bag. We have adapters for each kind of pouch. The eighth floor has these adapters on their floor, and then we have these in our office. Um, and those are these little things right here that you can stick your Foley bag into, and then make things a lot easier. We have two different closures. One is just a little stopper, and the other one is a little spout that you twist, one way to open and one way to close. The urine pouches, if you see the gold dot, that means they're open. If you don't see it, it means it's closed. Um, you'll only forget to close it once. So when changing an ostomy appliance, um, what we're really trying to do is make sure the skin is clean and dry so that our new pouch will stick and stay on the patient. We only clean with tap water or saline if you can't, you don't have the same candy for whatever reason. Um, 
Well, we want to avoid it. We want to avoid using soap. And we want to avoid using anything with emollients in it, like baby wipes. Um, soap kills off that good bacteria that lives on your skin, and patients will get yeast rash for their ostomy appliances. And then the emollients in like baby wipes make their skin just a little bit greasy, and their pouch won't stick. Um, or it might stick for a little while, and it'll wear off pretty quickly. We don't necessarily have to clean the stoma itself. They're kind of self-cleaning. Um, I might, if there was like some solid stool or something on there, I might wipe it off. But otherwise, it's pretty self-cleaning. It should always look pink, red, and moist like that. And just remember, skin has to be clean and dry before you put your new pouch on. So on a fresh stoma, um, usually the physicians are in there assessing pretty regularly, but if you were changing a pouch and you noticed this patient's stoma was looking a little dark and dry, you want to make sure that the surgeon knows that hey, the color didn't look that great when I saw it or you were um, But they are usually assessing those pretty frequently. So when changing the pouch, <clears throat> you want to make sure that you have all the supplies you need. We will leave a pattern in the room if we have changed the patient's pouch. We'll leave a pattern that you can trace for your new one. It makes it a little easier. So you can cut it out if you know kind of what size you need. Um, clean your stomach, skin. Make sure that's all clean and dry before you try to put a new pouch on. So when you cut a pouch, fit around a patient's stoma, if you want to leave about an eighth of an inch of skin visible. Um, so you want to cut this. Um, I usually, I kind of do it by sight. Um, I will cut it a little on the small side, kind of test it before I take the back of it off. If it looks like I need to trim a little more, I'll trim a little more and, and kind of go that route. I just want to be able to see about an eighth of an inch of skin around the stoma. And that ensures that we have good contact from our pouch, but that we don't have so much exposed skin that we're at risk of skin breakdown from the output. And I always try to get my patients to be still for about 10 or 15 minutes after the pouch change. It just helps the material that these are made out of to really stick and bond with their skin really well. They can just chill out for So when emptying a pouch, um, I always tell patients they can tell you if you're doing it wrong or whatever. It's not the way the ostomy nurse is taught them. Patients are never going to speak up hardly in front of that. <coughs> you want to empty ostomy pouches when they're about halfway full. If we let them get much more full than that, they can get too heavy and pop off, and then you have an even bigger mess to deal with. So just keep an eye on it. And this is nurse or tech. It doesn't, it's not just one or the other that has to empty ostomy pouches. It's anybody that's taking care of that patient. If we're in there just checking on that patient, we'll check their pouch and we'll empty it while we're in there. Um, Anybody that's going to get to that patient When you empty one of these pouches with a clamp on it, before you let anything come out of it, you want to fold this in back like a sock. So cuff it, roll it back like a sock, then empty it, and then take some tissue or something and clean these ends. Um, this is all odor-proof plastic, but if we don't clean these ends and they're sticking out of our clamp and have stool or whatever on them, they're going to start so we want to make sure these ends are clean. And the clamp, if you're using a clamp on the pouch, make sure it's clean. The other style of pouch that we have, and I'll pass this around too, um, it actually Velcros. Just get about some of my stuck into my bag. So anyway, this little pouch has a little flap at the bottom. And when we empty it, we need to roll this flap back. So that gives us a little rubber flap on each side. And then you can pinch it like a little old coin purse, empty it out, and then clean these little rubber flaps. And then to close this pouch, we have to close this bottom flap. This is what seals it. So we close it, you can see one set of Velcro dots, roll it again, see a second set, roll it a third time, and you'll see a little Velcro strip, and then you put your little tabs down. So it should be dots, dots, Velcro. Um, that's what I teach the patients. It's dots, dots, self pro, and they know they've closed it. Um, and it's the same thing, you put these ends clean. Your patient ever says, you can smell, smell something, or you come in the room and you can smell something, you need to check your pouch, make sure the ends of it aren't dirty, and make sure you don't have the leaks. You really shouldn't have any odor 
everything is intact and clean the way it's supposed to. So peristomal skin irritation, um, various causes. Patients can have an allergic reaction, a yeast rash. They could get skin breakdown from their ileostomy output. We basically treat most of it the same way, except for yeast. Um, we have stomach powder. You would sprinkle it on the raw areas and then take a no steam skin prep or a damp gauze and dab that stone powder, and that makes it form a sticky crust so that your palate will stick on top of it. You have to do that second step, that crusting with your skin prep or your damp gauze, or else your pouch isn't gonna stick. Um, the stone powder is also useful if you have severe incontinence dermatitis on a patient. You can actually sprinkle the stone powder on those raw areas, kind of dust off the excess of it, put your barrier cream over it, and that stone powder helps your barrier cream stick and stay in place a lot better. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind that's very useful with that real severe incontinence dermatitis. And sometimes we will write orders for that. You can order most of the off-duty supplies from materials distribution, net access. Um, have your charge nurse, you know, clerk can help you out with that. You can call us and ask us and we'll help you figure out what it is you need to order. If your patient comes in asking for something very specific, give us a call and we'll try to help figure it out, figure out what it is that they're, they're wanting. We do have ostomy accessories that you can order. We have barrier rings that kind of act like the wax ring that's on the bottom of the toilet seat. Um, it just improves the seal around the stoma. These are meant to be stretched to fit around the patient's stoma and your pouch goes over them. Um, and they just help improve your seal. We do have ostomy paste available, but we do not routinely use it just because it gets used incorrectly all the time. Ostomy paste is not glue. It's not meant to glue your patient's ostomy appliance down. It is meant to be used kind of in the same way that the ostomy rings are. It's meant to be used as caulk around their stoma to kind of improve their seal. Um, a lot of people think it's glue and it's It's usually resident, it's not even that glue. Um, you can order skin prep wipes and you can order stoma powder from your so if you can't keep a pouch sealed on your patient, if it keeps coming off during your shift and you can't figure out why, call us so we can come help you figure out what's going on. You know, maybe it's a simple step we're skipping, maybe they need a different kind of pouch, whatever it is, give us a call. If you notice skin breakdown under your patient's ostomy appliance, just make sure we know about that patient so we can assess what's going on. Any questions about supplies, call us. Um, patients will come in and they'll ask for weird stuff that's real specific that they use at home. You may or may not have it. Um, and we can hope to help you figure out what we have that we work the same. If you need a high output pouch, give us a call. If your patient has a newly created stoma that's created this admission, make sure that we're following that patient, please. Um, patients come in and they have emergency surgery and we're not called to mark them or see them beforehand and then it slips through the cracks on consulting us. And we've gotten consults the day a patient's being discharged and the day before they're being discharged, and that's not enough time to really teach somebody how to take care of their ostomy at home. So just make sure we're following that patient. If you know your patient, if you know ahead of time your patient's going to surgery and they're going to get an ostomy, see if we've come to see them in March. Um, goes a long way for quality of life if you can mark that patient beforehand for the ideal spot for their ostomy versus the physicians who see them when they're laying flat on the OR table and their belly looks great. That goes a long way in finding a good spot for the physician and that helps the patient out. So if you know ahead of time they're going, just leave us a message and say, hey, do you guys know about this patient? Um, any routine changes? If it's at night, we're not here. Um, if they've had their ostomy for four years, five years, 20 years, um, any kind of routine care of the ostomy is bedside nurse, um, responsibility, emptying the pouches could be the nurse or tech. Um, patients have new ostomies, we follow them and we try to teach the patient and family. But certainly if it's a new ostomy and their, patient, their pouch leaks in the middle of the night, it still needs to be changed. Um, it doesn't need to be covered with some gauze and tape in the hopes that the ostomy nurse will be there in the morning. Um, we're just setting our patients up for skin breakdown then and make pouching that much harder. And if you, if we are ever on the floor um, and your patient has an ostomy, if you want to come in or whatever, if you want to come in and watch us and learn how to change your pouch, that is perfectly fine. We do not mind showing that. And we've actually gone to a couple staff meetings and done in-service with the staff on changing an ostomy pouch. 
Um, one last thing, we do offer um, hyperbaric oxygen treatment to our inpatients. This comes from physician ordering, um, but you can consult that department through net access. They are on call Monday, Friday, they are on call seven days, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it will go through the transfer center after hours. And that is their number is 6004. This would be maybe some trauma patients, um, carbon monoxide, crush injuries, compromised flaps, things like that. There's a there's a list of things that can dive in patients for, and the physicians generally know that. And again, our office is 7032. My page is full. Just in case. Um, we'll go over the quiz real quick. I think I gave you a hand for that or something. Over so wound care standing orders can be implemented by the nurse without a physician signature. Approved. Here on the Erlanger internet, can wound care information be found? Yes, patient care library. A head to toe skin assessment should be performed and documented at least once per shift. True. Which of the following Braden scale scores indicates the patient is at risk for skin breakdown? 15. 15, yes. How long can a patient remain off suction before their negative pressure wound therapy dressing should be discontinued and a damp saline dressing applied? No, More than two hours. hours. Yes. For which of the following should you get an order for a wound care consult? Stage four, four pressure. pressure. Four pressure. Yes. 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 Um, how often should your patient be turned to prevent pressure injuries? Every two hours. 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 And when should you change an ostomy appliance? Hey, you know, um, that's you get yes. Yay. So do you guys think our wound care nurses are busy? Yes. <laughs> they do a lot of stuff. We do a lot. We go to North. We go to East. We're down here. Um, we do have a wound champion program. If you have any more wound care information, wound what? Wound champion program. We have kind of a wound care nurse that's always on for different facilities or departments. Um, and that would be sort of your communication person with our department. Um, so the champions, we try to educate on very specific things and some of their kind of the knowledge base to the department on whether it's staging or some of our protocols. And we actually, we try to get someone from day shift and night shift, and it doesn't have to be a nurse, it can be a nurse or tech, but we have several techs on the hospital who love to care and their champions to their department. And having somebody from night shift is very,